really, really important questions and um, good questions. <clears throat> I'm not going to go through the questions in order as how you send. And uh, some of the questions, since some of the questions are related to other questions, you know, probably I don't have to go through uh, all of them in detail. Okay. <clears throat> Where do I begin? Yeah, really, really. Some of them are very juicy questions. <laughs> okay, let's just begin with the first question anyway. The, the, the first question is, the practice of Buddhism is becoming expensive day by day with all the economic vulnerabilities surrounding due to COVID, war, and global economic crisis. How do any individual continue to fulfill practice Buddhism? That first question, and the question 19, I don't know whether the number means anything to you, but uh, is kind of related. So I'm also going to read out the question 19, which is, can enlightenment be simplified? People don't have time to stay in retreat to attain enlightenment. Can we attain enlightenment through work or do we, enlighten, do we attain enlightenment in a very short period? What's the shortest to enlightenment? Okay. Now, <clears throat> Always the case for so-called Buddhism. I need to tell you this first. There is no such word like Buddhism or Hinduism before. Well, broadly speaking, this term Buddhism and Hinduism is created by sometimes I say Abrahamic people, other times I say Westerners, because it is all going to do with this you know, the river Sindhu, right? So any, any seemingly religious that is beyond the Sindhu river, Hindu, Hinduism. So I want to just tell you that. Um, I'm sure you are quite familiar with the uh, Narendra Modi's rhetoric and whatever. They talk about something, they talk something about the Sanatana Dharma. Now, or sometimes they call it the Dharmic view. Uh, you can say broadly that, you know, we even use the word Dharma. Dharma is not really a religion. The challenge is, is also, you cannot really say it is not a religion entirely because it does seem to have a religiosity aspect. It's not really a science, but it is very scientific. It's not really a philosophy because Navarjuna, one of the greatest commentators of Buddhism, has refuted saying that if there is any view in Buddhism, then it is not a Buddhism or a Buddha Dharma, okay? So what I want to say is this, like in all the situation, um, Dharma or Buddhism always gets hijacked by culture of the hosting country. So when Buddha Dharma went from India to China to Japan to Korea, Laos, Cambodia, Bhutan, Tibet, the local culture always hijack 
And it sounds a little negative, but I need to tell you this. Culture is important. Because, for instance, if I want to drink a glass of water, I need the cup, I need the glass. But what I want is the water. If you want to do, if you want to actualize, let's say, a beginning state, if you want to practice Dharma, in other words, you need a culture. I mean, to begin with, we need to speak language. Language is a very big part of culture, right? <coughs> Without the culture, there is no, I mean, you cannot really relate to the Dharma. Without a glass, no drinking water. But what happens, especially in a traditional society like Bhutan, we end up putting so much effort in what kind of glass you have. Most of the people are actually holding an empty glass. Right? We are all worried about the glass, but we are all thirsty. Nobody really cares about the water. This happens a lot. Um, so your question seems to indicate that practice of Buddhism is becoming expensive day by day. I guess you are talking about things like dogma, pujas, rituals. I don't know, like all the butterfilinia that we, we think is what we call practice in Buddhism. <coughs> Here, I will tell you what really Buddha intended. B Buddhism fundamentally only cares for the truth. Denpa, we call it truth. Four noble truth, you know, etc., etc., two truth, truth, this truth, that truth, so four noble truth, or there are three characters, we call it three truths. That is actually probably the, yeah, that is the fundamental Buddhist truth. That is practicing Buddha Dharma. Is that expensive? I don't think so. You don't have to buy this, you just have to think about it, you just have to. You, you have to get used to that, right? And not just the death, by the way, we are not talking, you know, Buddhism, many people think that Buddhism is so pessimistic, always talking about death, etc. No. It can be something very exciting also. Who knows? Do you have Ferrari? Do you? Well, thanks to impermanence, maybe you will end up having one tomorrow. <laughs> we never know. So, this is also a good thing. Let's say you are really depressed. Nothing is working for you today. You are so down. But you can always encourage yourself. Tomorrow is another day. This is not expensive, you think. This, this is actually probably the cheapest to practice. The second, the second, but this is not enough, by the way. The second is, Okay, so what, what I just told you is basically in Sanskrit or Bali, it's called anicca, meaning everything is impermanent. When I say everything is impermanent, is it a religion? I don't think so. Is it a philosophy? Maybe. Is it a science? Maybe. But it is a fact. The fact is, everything is impermanent. Our ideas, our values, what we like. I mean, I used to like uh, uh, certain music. Now I can't stand this music, so on and so forth. Everything, okay? Now the second is Dukkha in Bali, which is basically what Buddha is saying is that nothing in our life gives you 100% satisfaction. Nothing. Be it a billion dollar, be it, I don't know, you must have so many aims, right? What is your utopian life? What is your utopian apartment? What is your utopian relationship? What is your ideal life? You may end up getting tomorrow, but it's 
not going to satisfy you 100 percent. That, knowing that, and getting used to that, really, getting really, really putting that in your system, in your thinking, in your mindset, that will liberate you from all sorts of illusion, all sorts of delusion, all sorts of ridiculous hope and fear. Is that expensive? I don't think so. <laughs> it's probably the cheapest, right? And it's a very fact. It's a factor. Now the last one, Ananda, <coughs> <coughs> which has a lot of different way of approaching, but I'm going to do it kind of a much in a simple way. Basically, Ananda fundamentally is everything is your projection or your opinion. Nothing is there, you know, like truly existing. Like, okay, democracy is good. It's our opinion. It's not a truly democracy, it's truly, ultimately, you can know, like, it is the almighty truth. No. Democracy is good. It's a projection. It's an opinion. Like that, whatever you value, whatever you see, whatever you decide, whatever you, I don't know, come to a conclusion, it is your projection. It's your opinion. And you need to know that. Not just intellectually, but practically, emotionally, you need to know that. Because by knowing that, you will become humble. You will become, oh yeah, this is just my opinion. That's his opinion, her opinion, <laughs> you know. But we don't do that. So these three, Anicca, Dukkha and Anatta, is probably the most fundamental Buddhist view. And getting used to that is practice. And living with that kind of principle is Buddhist behavior. So, is that expensive? I don't think so. Right? But, I do understand why the question is asked like this. Because, as I said, remember, we end up adding culture, tradition, culture. So, here you are saying, the practice of Buddhism is becoming expensive day by day. So, one of the reasons why it is becoming expensive is, because you need a shrine. And in front of the shrine there is the offering bowls. Offering bowls. Right? And then you need to do mandala offering. Right? All that. Now let's go one by one. Let's go through the offerings. The first one is drinking water. Do you know where that comes from? It's an Indian culture. If Buddhism, if Buddhism was originated from Mongol, it may be Allah. <laughs> Who knows? Because, because that's what the Shastra's drink. <laughs> if, if the second, the, the second, the second water is Shapsin, which is washing feet water. Do we wash feet? I don't think so. I mean, we, do we? And we don't, I mean, of course, nowadays you take shower and all of that, but you don't, when you invite a guest, do you go down, go and wash their feet? I don't think so. That's a very Indian thing to do. So we have a lot of that. And in the mandala, have you ever performed mandala? Lamba, Rambaji, Dajar, Rambaji, Makra, Rambaji, Dajar, Chambri, Dumba, Kepa, Matthema, Mandu, Makarma. What are you going to do with the elephant? <laughs> You know, Nanga Rumichita, Nandita, Tachwa Rumichita, those horse, those... If you give me elephant, I will suffer. <laughs> I don't know, where to put, where to put this elephant? <laughs> it is very expensive. Maintenance, everything for goodness sake. Where do you put this? And it might die in Timbu during the winter. <laughs> All of that. So, there are so many cultural stuff that, of course, I'm not here to denounce the culture. Of course, we Buddhists, sometimes we are so 
ridiculously obsessed with culture. So I mean, I'm not saying you should not. Mm -hmm. By all means, you, know, you, you can. But what I want you to <laughs> think about is, you know, water is water, glass is glass. What do you want to do? Drink water or drink glass? If you want to drink, if you want to drink water, it doesn't matter. Even this will do. Right? Just this will do. Drink like this. So do we have a pen? I need to cross out every all the questions I finished, otherwise. Or um, 100 kilo of gold. 
Just like that, 100, 100 plus people who have a defilement, anger, the desire, the jealousy, hope, fear, all kinds of you may be stealing, you may be lying, you may be cheating, doesn't matter. You are at the goal. This is one of the tantric, tantric called wisdom. And of course, I'm, you know, coming, you know, trying to really you know, simplify it as much as possible. Um, so again, uh, Bhutanese culture, yes, perhaps we have a lot of Vajrayana influence, a lot of it. Um, and some of them, they have become so embedded in our mind that we have become numb. I was just telling this today to the Guru, any day you will be hiding to watch a porn movie, right? Or lock the door and then you watch the pornography movie or a play or a magazine or something, you know? But you go to a Temple with all the male deity and the female deity, almost like a pornography, no? But do you even think like a pornography? You instead you say just a cheat. So you you hide the pornography or a playboy might have been like this. But here you are. So so there is that kind of culturally fitting, very culturally numbed, I guess. There's a lot of that. And then there's a lot of symbolism. Like Vajras. I don't know, there's a lot. I'm sure if I'm looking at this whole structure, there, may, there must be thousands of them. Um, and the names, for instance, how many dojis are here? There must be a lot of dojis here. Can you please raise your hand? No dojis? You? You are dojis? <laughs> two. Just two? Okay. How many Khandu are here? No? Okay. How many Pema? Pema. No Pema? Doji and Pema. You are both Doji and Pema. <laughs> wow. Fantastic. <laughs> Very good. So, um, as I said, these Doji Probably, I mean, I cannot say Dorji is exclusively Vajrayana language, but because Dorji, Dorji is basically something indestructible, right? And Padma, a big time Buddhist symbolism. Padma, or the Padma, Padma. Because what it, what it symbolizes is that Lotus, Padma, even though it's born in the mud, it's not stained by mud. So it's talking about your mind, your nature of the mind, even though you are within this sort of whole development, the nature of the mind is like a lotus, as pure and as, you know, pristine and as stainless as, you know, so on and so forth. So there is a lot of that kind of a cultural, culture. But I, I think I've already told you many times we end up getting hijacked by, um, let's say, let's say, um, the culture. And actually, actually, here I want to take this opportunity. Actually, sometimes the way we also choose, choose to act choose to, you know, when we use the culture to hijack the Dharma, we choose that culture as how you like. Okay, I'll give you one example. Probably, I don't know. I don't know whether this exists anymore. Rashukamura, maybe you know this. Do you, don't we have this habit of sort of looking down at left-handed people? Yonko? Here, no? Younger, no left-handed people. Probably you young people don't know. See, it's probably not really Bhutanese. 
originated from Bhutanese. I don't know. But you know in Vajrayana, in Tantrayana, the left-handed, actually there's even a lineage called left-handed lineage. It's considered very, very important. So on and so forth. Um, okay. Uh, female, woman. Again, now this is a, this is something that you need to, since you are a thinker, you are part of the think tank, you need to really pay attention to this one. So, woman, in in uh, in Vajrayana Buddhism, okay, especially in the Vajrayana Buddhism, woman is very special. They are actually they represent wisdom. In fact, one of the tantric, uh, what do you call it, mm, tantric vow or the tantric discipline. Tan Tantra has like some really major discipline, if you, major vow. And if you break one of this vow, you will violate the tantric practice. And this, like, 14 fundamental tantric vow and then the last one the 14th is if you look down at women physically uh, verbally conceptually you you will you know um, break the budget and I, well, that's how it is in the tantra but do we practice that i don't think so because then we choose to use another culture. We kind of conveniently not use this wisdom as our culture. We should actually. But then we use some other culture. So therefore we have all oh, women who can't go to, you know, like protector's room. And um, in fact, I don't know whether it was here, I'm getting mixed up with all the questions that I've been receiving. Women who have menstrual, uh, you know, situation should not go to the temple. No such thing. But no such thing in the sutras. No such things in the shastras. But you know, culture is so strong. Culture of habit is so strong. <coughs> so many times it really hijacks. The last topic. Another example I gave you. A Buddhist teacher in general, and uh, especially Vajrayana master, or the Vajrayana teacher. Anyway, the Buddhist teacher, they had to consider themselves as the healer, the doctor, and the teaching as the, what is it, medicine, and the student as the one who is a sick. So we need to have so the, between teacher and the student have to have a really a very open discussion about their ups and downs, about their habit. It doesn't matter. They have to have this kind of exchange. Is that happening in Bhutan? I don't think so. Because the lamas are always sitting on the high throne. You guys are not even able to look at his eyes. You don't you don't openly talk to them about how you are thinking about having a sex change, you don't think about maybe you have a lesbian tendency or anything like that because it's a cultural taboo, so on and so forth. So how is doctor ever going to diagnose? Because the doctor is sitting on the throne and the, the patient is on the throne and the, the connection between the doctor and the student is very distant. These are all Cultural, culture hijacking the wisdom, but it's not going to go away easily because we ourselves we feel that we are obliged, and we are also afraid that people will criticize us. You know, this is the sort of the society that we have. I mean, yesterday when I was. Uh, invited by Dasha, I asked uh, my staff to send me the photo where I'm sitting 
and then they arranged a throne here. And then I sent a message to Tashur, saying, if you have a throne or a scarf, I'm not coming. We have to like really negotiate like this. I totally have a sympathy with the organizers that they have to do it like this. Otherwise, all those Tongsa Kanjan Buchi fans, they will bomb, you know, they will smash you. <laughs> <laughs> right? You invite the Buchi to what center of uh, for uh, Bhutan's tradition? You didn't even offer a kata? What kind of people are you? You didn't put him in the throne? See, this is how culture hijacks wisdom. What to do? So I guess, and um, this is what I was telling you earlier, sometimes we can become so ridiculously obsessive with some of the culture which does not really serve our purpose. Something to think about, you as a thinker, you as a people who are in the think tank, you should really think about this one. Uh, oh yeah, I'm supposed to say, I'm supposed to give you this, um, explain Vajrayana, Theravada, and Mahayana in a simple form. Okay, simple form, little difficult, but I'll just briefly tell you this. Okay, Theravada. Okay, so your problem is, let's say, jealousy. Okay, let's choose your problem, jealousy. Jealousy is your problem. How do the Theravadan or the Shafakaryana deal with that? By hearing and contemplating that jealousy is ridiculous, jealousy is baseless, jealousy is a troublemaking, jealousy has a lot of downfall, etc., etc. So you, you read about it, you think about it, you basically try to, what do you call it? defeat the jealousy by bringing the notion of rejoice, pure perception, you know, like, so there is always that jealousy, antidote, rejoice, anger, antidote, love and compassion, so on and so forth. This is how the Theravada or the Shadvakayana deal with the jealousy, okay? Now, Mahayana, how do you deal with the jealousy? If you are a Mahayana Bodhisattva, since you are practicing Mahayana Bodhisattva practitioner, then when you are suffering with the jealousy, you think, may all the people's jealousy come to me. I will take everybody's jealousy. See, that kind of mind training. So, it's actually quite a wonderful technique because usually when there is a psychological or any kind of suffering, your immediate response is to reject, to get rid of. But here you have a reverse thinking. Okay, may everybody's jealousy, may everybody be free from jealousy, may their jealousy come to me. I will take all their jealousy. This is just a one of the Mahayana method, not all. I just want to give you a certain example. <coughs> now, the Vajrayana, how do they deal with the Vajrayana? How do they deal with the jealousy? Just Watch the jealousy. No, no, no judgment. No judgment. At all. Just watch, 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 watch. Because if you just without any judgment, without any story writing in your head, if you just keep on watching it, the jealousy transforms. Okay? This is a really, really big, big generalization to answer your question. <coughs> Otherwise, I'll be sitting here. I mean, I'll be. You'll have to employ me if I need you. You'll be smart. Okay. So, is that. How can. Okay, how can Buddhism be one when there are many divisions within the schools? Okay, so that's, that's an easy one. Um, actually, uh, the divisions are made by human beings, you know? You know, just as usual. 
Um, I just told you. Pam Jul She. Pam. Tell about the way of dealing with the jealousy. Uh, Jul transform the jealousy. Remember, I just told you. So, Buddha gave so many different kinds of teachings for different people out of compassion. You know, he said, once upon a time when I was a monkey, once upon a time when I was a prince, once upon a time when I was an elephant, so on and so forth. So there he indicates there is a past life, because once upon a time when you were an elephant, so on and so forth, past life, there is a continuation of a mind. Depending for, on, with the different kinds of audience, because even here, I can just, everything what I'm telling you is a big generalization. I'm sure you have a different capacities. Some of you can hear, in a, some of you probably want to hear in a different way, which I don't know. But if there is one, then which is okay, there's a small group of people who may want to hear the teachings in a different way. So what I may do is I may take them exclusively, not because they are special or anything, just because they hear it in a different way. <coughs> right? So that's how we sort of yanas, vehicles, ends up happening. Have you heard about the Four Noble Truths? This is the first teaching Buddha taught, right? So what did he say? He said, samsara is suffering, no suffering. Cause of the suffering is emotion. That's what he said in Varanasi to the five monks. But according to the tantric people, they were all other listeners. They were other listeners. Not just those five monks. Those, they heard different they heard, they, they heard it totally like, they heard, what did they hear? They heard, samsara is bliss, emotion is wisdom, totally the opposite. There is actually an account where in the sutra, once, um, oh yeah, Maybe this is a good, good example. Once Buddha coughed, a doctor heard and he thought, oh, Buddha needs some gentility. Cough syrup. Um, and an old lady heard into the oh, cause and condition. You know, dependent on the rise and cause and condition. And then another heard even a cough. People interpret in a different way. So there's a lot of that. But I think maybe what you are talking about here is things like, you know, Satya, Gaju, Gelu, Nyingma, all that. Yes, there is that. And why? Human beings. We like, we love clicking, right? I'm sure in this, this institute, you must have your own small, small clicks. Clicks, right? You usually go to the restaurant more than the rest, right? You always see you know, a small group here, a small group there, a small group here. It's, it's, it's how human beings function, isn't it? <coughs> okay, now do this one. Question 16 and 10. Question 10. Why lamas always go to places where there is money? <laughs> and Buddhism in this modern time seems to have become so materialistic. How do we ensure equity of opportunity to enjoy the truth of Buddhism if it is an expensive venture for a common human? Very good. Why lamas go to places where there is money? <laughs> no, I'm serious. I 
think that they should go more, but they don't seem to be an opportunity. <laughs> Really, I'm saying. I think there is a temple in uh, India called Tirupati, something, right? Tirupati, Tirupati, uh, some, somewhere in South India. Do you know every day how much donations they receive? Probably all the lives in Bhutan put together, still not even half. <coughs> Do you know how many, maybe one Vatican room in Italy? How much it cost? Putin is lamas are so poor. Really <laughs> nothing. Okay, maybe they have some cars, maybe some carpets. It's really nothing actually. Buddhism in the past, Buddhism enjoyed some great patronage. Like Ashoka, Hasha, Kanishka in India. But soon after that, Soon after the Pahas and Buddhas, Buddhist patronage is gone. Then Buddhism practically dead in India. The only, and then, but in China, till today, Buddhism really survived. Really strong. And in China, there was a big patronage. Tang, Ming, Qing, all those great, but, and then Kublai Khan, you know, one of the greatest warrior. So there was, yeah, maybe that time Buddhists enjoyed a bit of a wealth. After that, Buddhists are gone. It's not, there's not much. So from, from one point of view, I don't think Lamas even have a chance to go to places where there's money. But I think you, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> I think you're talking about probably Taiwan. Hong Kong, or maybe even among the, what is it, Thimbu, where is the rich place in Thimbu? I, I actually don't know. <laughs> Clock Tower? <laughs> where is it? The high Street. High Street? Yes, Thimbu Main. Yeah. Is that what you are talking about? <laughs> Jindas, big Jindas? Yeah, sure. That's nothing new. This is nothing new. You need to know that. Actually, yeah. This is actually nothing new. The corruption, materialism, spiritual materialism existed even before the Buddha and during the Buddha. You think this is something new? No. This kind of corruption existed way before. Probably today is probably even better actually. Because there's Instagram, there's a Facebook, the Lamas, they better behave, otherwise, you know, everything gets exposed, <laughs> right? So, so, actually, probably things may be better because of so-called, you know, media. So they have to be a little bit careful, then they have to sort of hide their gold nugget in the, and pretend that they don't have. The corruption, spiritual materialism existed long ago. I don't know that, I mean, probably it may have gotten better, but maybe not. Um, but I'm not saying that this is the right way. I'm just answering your question. Why the law is doing that? I'm just, I'm, just since you are a thinker in this think tank, I'm just saying, In one way, Lamas, the Buddhists are poor, really, they are deadly poor. Not just poor, they are deadly poor. <laughs> they have nothing. Have you been to Iran? Have you been to uh, some of the mosques? Have you been to some of the church in Europe? One toilet of the church probably can be to several monasteries here. So, I don't know, you have to have a perspective, right? But if you are saying that, that 
the lamas are materialistic and corrupted? Yes, for sure. Many of them, but there are some really good ones also. So, but that, that is always like that. Even during the Buddha's time, there was someone called Gehong Lepi Karma, right? And there was a whole story about that. They're corrupted, they're fake. Yes, let's talk about the fake ones. Because about this nowadays, we could witness lots of tulpus being enthroned and recognized. What is your view on contributions to the Buddha Dhamma by fake tulpus and numerous Campus tulpus traveling abroad to make dollars? I think we have already covered that bit. But I will explain anyway. There are different tulpus coming to limelight every now and then in Bhutan. Most Buddhist people are blurred by blind faith. Blind faith. Let's talk about blind faith a little bit afterwards. As long as they hear about Tupu, they are ever ready to receive blessing from kids of three or four years old. Very true. The Tupu seems itself has become corrupt like a bonzi business model. What is it which is view on that? Slash Tupu's own big and luxurious monasteries of Faham. Does this have anything to do with the portraying supremacy within the religious community? Very good. Um, evolution of Dharma practice. <coughs> there have been many claimed gurus. How do we authenticate between the genuine and fake Rinpoche and Trukus? So these are sort of related questions. So I'm going to generally answer the question. How do you authenticate the genuine Trukus or Rinpoche or Campos or... Wow. I can't tell you anything about that. <laughs> not possible. There is no, there is no organization in Buddhism from time immortal where it, is, where it gives a stamp, okay, you are the authentic and you are not. You understand? There isn't. And I shall thank for that. I shall thank the fact that there is no organization that gives the authentic stamp for a good to go or a bad to go because I could easily corrupt them. Right? This society, this group. Because it, it's again another human endeavor. So, yes, there's a lot of charlatan. I've actually written a book about Guru. About the Guru. And I have dedicated my book to the charlatans because they make the life very, very interesting. Charlatans and fake ones. And how do you, how can you tell? Mm. It's very subjective. I mean, I can tell you few, I can tell you few criteria, few information. Okay. Usually we always talk about Chen Se Nu Sum, right? Chen Se Nu. Oh no, wait. Um, um, what is it? Ke Zun Zang Sum. Ke Zun Zang. Ke. Now that one you can. That one you can judge. Ke means scholastic or not. Is he a learned one or not? That one you can figure it out. Just go with a few questions. List of questions and then ask them, okay, how many stages the Bodhisattvas are there? Ten. Good. You know that. Right? <laughs> you know, ten you can do. How many, you know, stuff like that. Who is the main disciple of the Buddha? How many, just, you know, all of that you can ask. And you can even go deeper questions, philosophical, uh, academical, intellectual questions. That one you can do. But that quality, is actually not the most is not the most important. It is important, but it's not in, not the most important. Because there's a lot of learned people who are crooks. Learned people are actually are better at being crook. <coughs> they actually can really because they can exhibit their knowledge and then that's it. You are like flattened. Right? 
So the next, next quality to check whether the plumber is genuine or not is Zun. Zun means discipline or not. Are they walking the talking? Walk the talk, right? You know the gurus, the lama says don't drink, but they drink. They, they tell you don't eat meat, they eat meat. They tell you not to do all kinds of things, but they do themselves. You know? So who is actually walking the talk? Who is actually really disciplined? So that is something that... But this one is much more difficult to analyze. Because discipline is much more subtle. I mean, you can still sort of get up three in the morning and wait when this lamb is getting on. Stuff like that. A few things you can do it, right? You can sort of maybe put a CCTV on his bed, bedroom, and see what he does. Is he really disciplined or not? It's much more difficult than care. To how to analyze the care. Much more, but it's still doable. Now, the next one is the most difficult. And it's the most important. Zang. Zang. Ke zun zang. Zang is kind. How do you value whether he is kind or not? Somebody who is really, really kind can be really, really tough with you. Right? Someone who talks straight. No, you can't do this. Many times you may not like it. You can't just tell this lover is not fake because he's so smiling, he's, he never gets angry. But, you know, there's a lot of gentle, soothing people in the our world, but they're very selfish, they don't care about you, etc. So this one is difficult. But I want to talk a little bit about Tulku because this is an important question. First, the Tulku means manifestation. By the way, you need to differentiate between Tulku and Yamasi. Yamasi means reincarnation, re-exist. Actually, reincarnation in English word is not good. It's not a translation of Yamasi. Yam means again, Si means exist or emergence, right? So Yamasi coming once again, okay, re, yeah, so once again exists, once, yeah, yang again exists, that's yang si, and the turku is manifestation, and actually this one, there's another question, hmm? <coughs> oh yeah, why are females not the ones, the highest religious figure? Why there's not many female turkos? Very good question. Hmm, cultural hijack. Remember? We live in a we live in a patriarchal culture. We I mean male, dominant, male, everything male, male, male. It's nothing to do with the Buddhism again. It's about culture. Um Tulku is manifestations. I mean, you are asking me a question, why are females not reborn as the highest religious figures? First of all, the real answer is, there must be a lot of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas manifestation as a female, as a prostitute, as a bartender, as a... I don't know. But actually it goes beyond. Manifestation, Tulpa, Sanjiki Tulpa, manifestation of the Buddha can be a bridge. It can be a garden, it can be a cup of coffee, it can be a breeze when you are so sad, a breeze comes and you feel happy. But we don't think about those things. We are talking about a human tuku, as your question rightly put it. Small baby who can't even wipe his own nose, sitting on the throne, giving blessings, getting spoiled, all of that. Why is this happening? Think about it. Culture again, tradition. Let me, let's discuss this. Big, big part of the Turku, 
removed the system today. Okay, first of all, I should tell you this. First, Tulku and the reincarnation. I mean, reincarnation is a wonderful concept in Buddhism. I mean, you are a reincarnation of your past life. You know that, right? You are Yangtze. You know, you are actually Yangtze. But the fact between you and me, I'm on, I am recognized Yangtze by a group of people. That's the only difference between you and me. You must be a Yangtze of, I don't know, Napoleon? <laughs> <laughs> Alexander the Great? I don't know. Maybe a bird? Maybe a, a pig who lasted 20 years ago who was eaten during the dosa? <laughs> Anything. Yangtze. Okay? But I think you need to know this. In Tibet, because this Trumpu business, the Yangtze business, became such a big thing in Tibet. Well, historically it started. The Trumpu tradition started from the Karmapa. You must know that, right? But now, in Tibet, as you know, Buddhism became a very, very, very influential, you know. It's a very... After the Tsum, after the Chirarajan, you know, wow. Buddhism is probably... I mean, uh, Buddhism basically took over. You could almost say that. In fact, in fact, I met a lot of young Tibetans who are not necessarily Buddhists. They actually blame Buddhism for destroying the Tibetan original culture. I have a sympathy with them. I have a sympathy with them. Um, even the name giving, okay, for us in Bhutan. Um, Tashi, any Tashi here? Tashi? You see, that's a Buddhist name. And do you know what that is? That's actually Indian name. It's not a, it's not a Bhutanese name. It's not a Tibetan name. Tashi is a you know, Mangala, Mangalam. And how about, I don't know, Pinzo? How many? How many Pinzo? Is there any Pinzo? Today, whatever the name I'm saying, there is a Pinzo. Then you are Pinzo, right? It's actually Indian name. Lakshmi, right? <laughs> it, it, it's something to do with the Lakshmi, Lakshmi, Kinzo, Lakshmi, Lakshmi, yeah. How about Wangchu? Um, oh my goodness. Wangchu? Wow. What a classic Indian name. It is. It is. Wangchu? Yeah. Shiva? You know, Mahadeva? Wangchu? are all Indian names. What is our Buddhist real name? Tehong, right? <laughs> Isn't it? Right, Tehong. Then what else is there? Nago. Isn't it? Nago. What else? Kato. What? Kato. Kato. Nago. Kato. Whatever. All of that. And even in Tibet, like Asian Tokyo, Kandu Asian Tokyo, Kandu Yeshe Tokyo. Yeshe Tokyo is a Buddhist name coming from an Indian Yeshe, of course, Jana. So, you know, ocean, yellow, you know, like that. I don't know, rain. Her real Tibetan name is Kachinsa. Kachinsa. And that's so beautiful. Kachinsa. Kachin means big house. Za is girl, right? So, the girl from the big house. So there's a lot of that. Um, anyway, what I'm trying to say is Buddhism became very, very strong influence in Tibet. So when Buddhism becomes strong influence in a society, in every level, politically, from social aspect, politic, culture, architecture, right, education. So. Some of the tools become powerful, of course. They become very powerful, they become influential. Plus, 
Many of the uh, Tibetan lamas have a big patrons coming from Mongolia, coming from China. Big patrons. You guys are talking earlier about why are lamas going to some place for, with the money? This did not much. In the past, big time. Big time. Really. Like Mongol, you know, they very rich. So then what happens? So when the Turkus become influential in the society, politically and everything, obviously there will be a corruption. I want to be powerful. I want to be powerful. My wife is beginning to become pregnant. Oh, oh, it's a true group of so and so. This happens a lot. Has dropped. By the way, you know, please bear in mind, not all the troopers are corrupted or, you know, like, nasty or, you know, they are not, you know, incredibly, you know, like, compassionate, kind, and illuminating troopers and troopers and youngsters. But, what I'm saying is that this trend has become so big. So then also, so nowadays it still continues. Of course we don't have that much of power politically or socially, but we still do, the troopers do. So here, you, here this is what you need to think. Actually, troopers' parents, especially the young troopers' parents, they are really, I dare say, they are almost like a criminal. They are really ruining a kid's life. It's really, really sad. Actually, it is, you know, some, you know, you guys should really think about this. Parents put this kid on a throne or whatever, exhibit as a high, high Ugandan lama, whatever. Every attention is given to this. Best food, best clothes, so many attendants, all of them. <coughs> slowly, slowly, this human being is beginning to become alienated from the rest of the society. Most of these groups don't know how to relate to anyone. Because everything is delivered on the plate. Come age 17, 18, 19, 20, Turku's puberty is coming up. Turku is becoming horny. Turku is becoming, Turku is becoming, you know, biologically changing. And by then, good part of the childhood has been totally damaged and ruined. And then these Turku's photographs are everywhere. So now poor guy can't even hide like all the other things can do. Wherever this kid goes, photographers are there, attentions are there. When the Drupal is young and cute and sitting on the throne, everybody is like, oh how sweet he is, oh he is so beautiful. The same Drupal in about 20 years time, look at that Drupal, running around in Babesa. <laughs> look at that Drupal. Can you see how unfair we are doing this? Who is doing this? Not the Drupal. Drupal from a very young time, they are not demanding any of that. It is the parents, it is the society, it is the culture again. So, yes, something to think about. If you, if you, if you really need to think about this. I have personally told many of people whom I feel that I can talk to when they say, oh, they are Drupal. Because so and so Lama has given a paper saying that he is a Drupal. My first response to this group, this parents are, can you just hide that document for the next 20 years? Put it in a safety deposit. Don't show. Give the Drupal good education. Make him explore. Make him do whatever. Make him roll in the dust. Make him even become a waiter if you, if you think it's necessary in some 
women's dingy restaurant, making date with the girls. I even said this, these scribbles, they needed to be, you know, I once, I remember even telling people that I want to actually train some girls to make these scribbles to fall in love with this girl, and then the morning they fall in love, they reject the scribbles. <laughs> Because the Turkus need to Turkus need to go through that rejection because it's a lesson. You know, you know, you know it makes the because they're supposed to be a human, they're supposedly going to be a leader, teach, coach. How are you going to coach when you can't handle your own you, you know small things like rejection? So yes, this is a big concern. Um, anyway, I think uh, I've answered many of these questions, so um, yeah, like you, you, the one element of the question is why do you which is focus on big and luxurious monasteries and accounts? It's all like it has become that. If we, if we look at our forefather, Lord Gavipas, Milarepa had nothing. He was eating natural soup. He was staying in a, you know, cave. Down the line, not only individually we get corrupted, but as a society, we somehow end up it, it has now ended up becoming a norm. A Turku must have a big monastery. And the monastery, I mean, we can talk about the monastery. Monasteries that are being built everywhere, not just in Bhutan, just everywhere. I don't know. Have you been to Japan? Have you seen Daitokuji in Japan, which is one of the biggest monasteries, Zen monastery? In Japan, I think they have only like six months. It's empty. Most of these monasteries may end up becoming empty. So there is no forward thinking because, you know, why do we don't have the forward thinking, the Lamas, the Lubuches, Turbos, and in fact, you guys also? Because many times we are ridiculously obsessed with some culture. I believe to why. You know, you give me to, and we have to do something. So we are stuck. We get so stuck with a certain norms. Okay. Now, as per the constitution of Bhutan, religious body and practitioners are not allowed to take part in the politics of the country. Therefore, do, do you think it's applicable in our society? When I heard this first time, as a Buddhist, as a practitioner myself, I was very happy that the government of Bhutan really came up with this. As a Buddhist, as a practitioner. Because looking at the Buddhist history, actually, you see the thing is this, Buddhism, I told you, is not really a religion. Well, I think the Indians will call it Sanatana Dharma, right? It, that's what it is. It's like truth, truth based. It's a truth based thinking system. You know, like Christianity, Islam, Judaism, politics is very intertwined, as you can see. You know, even the emergence. How did the Islam give birth? There's a lot of there's a lot of actual poly, political situation. So Islam, and this is why they can say Republic, Islamic Republic of so and so, Christian Republic of so and so. But you can't really say Republic of Buddhism. You cannot. Because what? Because you know, I told you, Buddhism is about anicca, dukkha, and another. What what is what are we republicing about? 
Because it's about Shunyata, it's about Anicca. You know, there's no, for goodness sake, Buddhism does not even have a marriage ceremony. Actually, I mean, now we do create, just we throw some flowers and recite some verses. But in the sutras and the shastras, we don't have marriage ceremony. If you insist to have one, more likely the Buddhism priest will say, Okay, you two get married, but do you know, in reality, you may get divorced. <laughs> That's how it should be. A real Buddhist marriage will be saying, you know, probably you will die tonight. That's how. Will it work? It won't. Because Buddhism is a truth-based system. So, if you look at the history of Buddhism, you will realize Sri Lanka, maybe now, definitely in Tibet. And I know many of my Tibetan friends may not like me saying this, but Buddha Dharma in Tibet really declined ever since the Lamas took the political role. It has. It has ruined, because it actually ruined both faiths. It ruined Buddhism and it ruined Tibetan secular life too, because these Lamas they are hopeless with the defense, economy. They are hopeless with things like policing. Because they are all the time they have been trying to give initiation, give one, give teaching on Shunyata, you know. But you need that, right? Not only that, they, oh, you know, we are Buddhists. We don't need the army. So on and so forth. So it's... And when you become a political leader, there's always a disharmony because there's always an opposition, opposition thinking. So there's no harmony, right? So when government of Bhutan introduced this, personally, you know, I was really happy that Bhutan did this. But we have to be realistic. Is it possible? Maybe not. Really, maybe not. Yes, religious people may not be allowed to vote and all of that, which is fine. But, I want of you, if you want to...